and where to find food. Adult wolverines can cover vast distances over the harshest of terrain, even in the dead of winter. But like any superhero animal, wolverines have a weakness. And it's a big one. A wolverine at 35 below zero can just pretty much kick back and relax. I mean, they can handle it. But what about the upper end? There's got to be some point where it's just too hot. Wolverines will only make dens in snow that lasts until the second week of May. Global warming is reducing the number of places for them to den. Usually, climate change is a very gradual, long-term thing, and animals can often adjust unless there's some specific characteristic of the climate that they are directly tied to. And we think that may be the case with the wolverine in its dependence on snow. Unless glaciers wolverines are able to adapt to a changing climate, populations here may disappear. Other animals face a similar predicament. One may be more vulnerable to global warming than any other mammal in the lower 48. It's called a pika, an elusive species with extraordinary qualities. Lucas Moyer Horner searches for pikas in high altitude rocky outcrops. He studies their behavior and tries to get a count. They only can live in talus fields, boulder piles, and those are only found in mountain ranges. Even if he can't see them, he can count their food caches and note their distinct sound. That's a pika. OK, here's a pika hay pile. Few visitors get to see a pika, but just when you least expect it. Here's a pika right now. A rare encounter with one of the most uniquely adapted mammals on the planet. And this one isn't shy. <laughs> I've never had him do that before. It most likely wants the salt from the sweat on Lucas's clothes. Oh, he actually got through my pants. Congratulations. You chewed a hole through my pants. Pikas are used to getting nutrition from unusual places. They are so adapted to the cold, they don't hibernate, but stay under these rocks beneath up to 20 feet of snow for eight to nine months of the year. To survive, they'll even eat their own feces. There's some nutritional value to it, and they'll actually collect the feces of other species too and eat that. Like this is some marmot scat right here. The problem comes when it gets too warm. If they're outside, an ambient temperature of about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, they'll die after about half an hour of exposure. I think they're emblematic of the type of animal that is going to have trouble dealing with climate change. And I think we can learn a lot from how they respond. Southern populations will almost certainly disappear as it gets warmer. The only question, how long before that happens here? There are a lot of changes here. Glacier Park's gonna look a lot different without snow and ice. 
Dan reaches a major milestone on his hike to Blackfoot Glacier. He gets his first good look since part of it collapsed two years ago. Even at a distance, he's shocked. Blackfoot was once the largest glacier in Glacier National Park. Now, from afar, Dan Fagri sees it breaking up. The whole glacier is really coming apart. And now it looks like there's 80, 100 feet of ice is melted. This is quite a bit different than we last saw it. For a more detailed assessment of glacier melt, scientists dig into the archives. A good view of a glacier is precious to an expert like Dan. Yep, okay, now we're getting closer. If he can get in the exact right spot. Okay, this is looking good. Sexton Glacier is one where the melting isn't so obvious. Dan aligns his camera to match a photo taken in 1930. Well, there we can see the glacier as it was. There was an open meadow. There's a guy on a horse there. There's a photographer there. Well, I think this is probably the exact perspective. Subtle differences tell him this glacier is thinning. Elsewhere, old photographs side by side with new shots show extreme changes. It's a park-wide meltdown. Even glaciers that showed little melting for decades now rapidly retreat. And that's not the only change Dan sees. Notice the species of conifer. This entire scene has changed because there's no longer white bark pine here. They've been killed. You're not only seeing changes in glaciers, but you're seeing changes in the trees in the same photograph. Those missing trees, white bark pine, can still be found in the park. And those who search for them hold great hope for the tree's future. That's 0.18 miles, so off in this direction. Rebecca Lawrence and her group scour the backcountry for survivors of blister rust, a disease caused by a fungus that strangles white bark pine. They start to die from the top down. This is pretty typical. The white bark population in Glacier used to be a fifth of the forest, and there are huge stands uh, throughout the park that are just decimated and just skeletons, essentially. The fungus was accidentally brought to North America from Europe around 1910. How it may spread with global warming, no one knows for certain. This pine's seeds are high in fat, they're a key food source for many species. So every pine lost hurts. The good news, every now and then, specialists find a white bark pine that seems to be resistant. I'm so excited. Good. Tight on the rope. Climb away. You think I should go a little higher? Stacy Jacobson Burgard climbs 30 feet in search of just the right cones. The pollen cones look really healthy. They look beautiful. There's a chance that the seeds may also grow into trees resistant to rust. So these are the female cones for next year. They take two years to develop. 
In the meantime, they can be eaten by squirrels and birds. Well, this is a cone that's been um, predated by probably a squirrel. So we're trying to prevent the squirrels from eating the cones right now so that we can collect the seeds and to help maintain the population. Okay, are you ready with my cages? Okay. So the team uses mesh cages to protect the cones. Okay. I'm going to just make check the bottom again, make sure that I don't have any openings there for critters. It looks good, they're tight. I'm, I'm happy with them. In a few months, the team will return to collect healthy seeds. They'll grow them in a forest service nursery and replant the young trees in the wild. Already, more than 6,000 have been planted. Our last white bark pine planting had 72% survival. It makes me feel like maybe we can help the species stay without slipping over the edge of, of extinction. Glacier Park managers fight to protect plants and animals threatened by warming. but nothing in our power will stop the glaciers themselves from disappearing. It does look steeper than we thought, doesn't it? Dan Fagri and his group hike their last mile to Blackfoot Glacier and the section that collapsed. we get across at one section, we don't know how big the streams are and how dangerous it'll be to cross. What they find will help estimate how long it will be before all the glaciers are gone for good. At last, over the last ridge to Blackfoot. Dan Fagri braces himself for the worst. Dramatic signs of how quickly Glacier National Park will lose its glaciers. But what they find first is a paradise. Revealed by the receding glacier, the extent of which they've never seen firsthand. It's pretty impressive. Blackfoot Glacier has carved the rocks here into shelves and steeps. They now channel pristine water into aqua green lakes. And spectacular cascades. The glaciers are retreating and revealing all this sculpted landscape. And it's really kind of like a large playground. It's kind of an amphitheater of a thousand waterfalls. Just on the edges, there's a little bit of fringe of vegetation. The ice used to reach more than 100 feet above Dan's head. Now, he walks on bare rock. As the glacier retreats, it leaves a signature. 
and you can see all the striations where rock that was embedded at the bottom of the glacier has scraped across this. That's a very telltale sign that this area has been heavily worked by an active glacier. Large chunks of ice break off without warning. We would try to get up on high ground. We have to move very quickly. Dan cautiously makes it to the leading edge of Blackfoot. For the first time, he can see up close what is seasonal snow versus what is permanent ice. This is pretty massive. I mean, we have a, a face here that's 30, 40 feet high, and this is what broke off from the rest of the glacier and went cascading down behind us here. Once you see some disintegration occurring like this, the models that rely on gradual melting are basically not so good anymore. These glaciers are definitely melting three to four times faster than they used to. As the glacier thins and moves over some of the humpy topography, it just shatters, it just disintegrates. And so it's hard to believe that a glacier can go away this quickly, but when you have a situation like this, these glaciers could be gone in a decade or so. Everyone thought the glaciers would be here for at least 20 more years. Now it seems about 10. Blackfoot itself, once the park's largest glacier, now has areas so thin, they'll likely go even faster. The landscape it carved will remain, but without the ice melt in late summer, most of these waterfalls will cease to flow. This brand new valley of roaring cascades will become a mere whisper. It'll definitely be sad to see the glaciers go. But when you see this sculpted landscape, it's really a very kind of aesthetic area to be in. This is going to be an interesting part of the park for a long time, even after the glaciers are gone. This wilderness is undergoing dramatic changes that we are only beginning to understand. Plants and animals have little time left to adapt to a warmer park. Bears will likely fare better than most. Others will fight to adapt. The more sensitive may be lost from the park altogether. What will remain is a dramatic new landscape. Glacier National Park will keep its name. Even when the ice is gone, the impact of the glaciers will live on. They are like giant sculptors, leaving us with a great work of art to admire for eternity.